coming to the first W. What is exactly SC Linux? Anybody has experience working with SC Linux here? Okay. So SC Linux in a layman term is nothing but a labeling system. What exactly I mean by label is, so every, every process, every port, every IPC, every file, every socket, all of them could be labeled with one name. That is what is called labeling. And SC Linux is actually implementation of a MAC, which is the mandatory access control. What exactly is mandatory access control is, it's a bit different from the regular DAC. DAC is the discretionary access control where every file will have permission. Who is the owner, who is the user and others. Like the way we do Chmod 0777, right? That is the regular. But what is the problem with DAC? Root user. Root user is omnipresent. If he is a root user, he can go and literally access any file. But that's not the case with MAC. So when I say mandatory access control, right? This is not a replacement for DAC. That's the point I wanted. So the first check will always be the DAC. So that means he is the user having rights to access that file. He, he has access to read, write or execute. Then only over that MAC will be applied. So what are the terms which I'm going to be using in the future slides is one is subject, other one is the object. Subject is a process which is trying to access anything. It could be a port, it could be a file, it could be anything on the system. Objects are the one which are getting accessed. SC Linux policy is the one which dictates which subject can access which object. That is what exactly is SC Linux. And who writes this policy is the developer. It is the developer who ships the software. And who enforces this is the kernel. So what we traditionally do if you are developing a software is if you want to enable SC Linux, on your particular application, then you need to ship a policy which gets on the runtime to the kernel and all the LSM modules get implicated. So where did actually SC Linux come from? SC Linux actually was first developed by NSA. Later it was uh, moved to Red Hat as a ownership. Now it is a combined ownership of Red Hat, a Fedora community and NSA. So if you look at the SC Linux policy, right? How does the decision process happens? As I explained before, let's take a subject which is a process and it is requesting for an action. Example, read on a file. So the kernel will look at the SC Linux policy database, try to make a decision seeing that is this process or the subject, is it having read access on this particular guy? If it is granted, he gets to access the object. If it is not, there will be a ABC denial. Let's come to the ABC denial in the future slide. So I have mentioned that what is SC Linux? I've told it's a labeling system and it is one form of mandatory access control. So then probably one thing would be running in your mind that is SC Linux the only mandatory access control? If not, why only SC Linux? There are other implementations of MAC like App Armor, which is famous for Ubuntu and SLES. Um, but why SC Linux is? Nowadays, people are trying to ship their software across platforms. So they ship their application in such a way that it works on server, application, mobile, cloud, everywhere. So SC Linux is one such guy which has been there around for 18 years. That's the first thing on the server line. And it has been in the mainline kernel for 15 years. And it has been in the enterprise Linux for 13 years. And also how many of you are running Android 6.0 and above? So probably all of your phones are actually AC Linux enabled. And moreover, as I told that the next gen data centers are looking at security compliances. One of the important compliance is open SCAP and open SCAP also has a rule saying that any process running on your server should not be unconfined. That means he should have a AC Linux policy associated with that. So, we have seen what is SC Linux, where did it come from, why SC Linux. Now let's look at how it exactly works. In order to understand how it works, right, there are two fundamental concepts that we need to understand. One is labeling, the other one is type enforcement. So I told you in my previous slides that every object or every subject is associated with a label. 
but where is this label actually stored? Any idea? Okay, close by. But the thing is, if it is a file, it is actually saved in the file extended attributes of the file system. But if it is for a process or a port, it is actually handled by kernel. So this is how a traditional, uh, so the other point is, okay, if, you, if I have labeled a file, how do I see it and what is its format? Like if you want to see the read write execute permission, what command do you run? Usually you run ls minus l, right? So for anything related to SE Linux, you have to append a capital Z. So this is what it looks like, how an index file is actually labeled. You can see that it is of the format user, role, type and MLCS. For now, try to understand that this is the labeling system and focus more on what is the type because next we are going to see what is exactly the type enforcement. So here index.html is actually assigned with a label called httpd syscontent underscore t. So that is the type of this file. This is saved in the extended attributes. So as I see a mixed crowd here, let's not get too much technical to understand type enforcement. Imagine your house is an operating system and you're the kernel and you have two pets cat and a dog. Imagine cat and dog as a process in an operating system and there are two kinds of food which is cat food, dog food. So you being a kernel, you so you know cat should eat cat food, dog should eat dog food. That's fair enough, right? So you this is exactly what type enforcement means. Allow cat to eat cat food and what is the operation? Eat. He can eat it. And the second one is allow dog to eat dog food. This is what is the format of type enforcement. We will come to the real world examples in the later slide. So when the cat tries to eat the cat food, then you allow it and the dog eats, you do allow. So the interaction is successful, both the pets are happy. But if the cat comes and asks you for more cat food, will you give it or not? Because it's in the rule, you are allowing it. What if the dog gets naughty and tries to eat cat food? You stop it. because there is no rule saying that the dog is supposed to eat cat chow. This is exactly what AC Linux does. And on the vice versa, if the cat looks yummy at the dog food, you are not going to allow it because it's against the rules. So if you look at the real world example of exactly this, right? This is what it looks like. So do you think that any web server is supposed to read a database file? No, right? So what exactly is happening here is, let's say there are two processes, one is Apache and MariaDB and both of them are labeled in accordance with their policies. That means MariaDB is labeled as MySQLD underscore T type and Apache is labeled as HTTPD underscore T. So we have a type enforcement saying that HTTPD can only read syscontent, HTTP syscontent T and MariaDB can only read MariaDB type. So in case, in case, if your Apache had a vulnerability and people somehow tried to hack it, so what does he get? He gets access to read anything. If this policy was not in place, he literally has the cap capability to read any file on the system. But just that Apache is supporting SE Linux and SE Linux is on, he is not allowed to read anything from your database which might have confidential things. Okay, this works, this looks very good with the traditional because we had two processes or we had two pets which are of totally different, one is cat, one is dog. What? So the other question is, we never run always two process, right? We can have identical. So you got money, you bought another dog. Now you have two dogs. One is of type Fido, one is of type Spot. How do I handle this? What if they are not supposed to eat each other food. Though they are dogs, but they are of different nature, they are not supposed to have more beef or something like that. How do you restrict this? That is where multi-category comes into picture. You, have, you must have seen when uh, the labeling was there, the last column, MCS or MD, let me show you that. This part, so the, yes, the first, where I showed cat and dog will be suffice with type. But when you have two different dogs or two different process of the same kind, that's where 
MCS comes into picture. So what exactly happens in MCS is, and again, going further, I'm saying, none of this MCS is not a replacement of type enforcement. This is along with the type enforcement. If you remember my previous example, cat, uh, dogs are not allowed to eat the cat food, right? Here also, there are two, two kinds of dogs, Fido and Spot, and we have actually, but the food is still same, dog food, right? So we actually give them a category. For this kind of food, we are giving category, which is dog food Fido and dog food Spot. But the type enforcement is still in place. So if he tries to eat a cat food, the colonel will still stop him. And in the he is supposed to eat only of his category food. What could be the real world example of this? Anybody? This is very much useful when you are actually running containers or virtual machines. So what happens here is, let's say we have seen so many of the microservices talks today morning as well, right? Let's say there is a fundamental um, subject which is divided into so many microservices. All of them actually achieve the same top goal, but they have different roles. So that's where you categorize the people. So let's say you are spawning two containers, by default they take category C1 and C2, they are mapped to C1, C2 from the S word side and lib word, there is an image associated with the same category. Let's say there is another instance of container. So they take categories C3 and C4, so their images will be on C1 and C2. So you might be having a question that why can't the first type enforcement work? Imagine a case like this, imagine the same case without the categories. What happens is you will write a rule saying that S word T can go and write anything in the S word T image. But what is the fundamental rule of virtual machines or containers? The main important goal what they achieve is isolation and encapsulation. So they are not supposed to read and write each other's data, correct? That's where the category comes into picture. So now that you have associated category to each of these containers and virtual machines, they can never go and corrupt any other images. That's where you are achieving more, uh, you know, encapsulation there. So you might be thinking that, okay, there are already security models like uh, SecComp. How is it different from this, right? So SecComp is actually a bit different from this. SecComp allows you to define that this particular category of virtual machine or something can only run these system calls. But this is different. That does not provide you isolation. This exactly provides you isolation. So, yeah, this is implemented at the namespace level. This is provided by libvirt. Okay. But provided that you need to ship a policy saying that I should read this and this. In that case, uh, for a VM and for a container, it will be different, right? Uh, for because container will be using uh, namespaces uh, based on LXE. Correct. Whether you are running a VM or a container, you know what your application is supposed to do. You know what your application is supposed to read or write. Based on that, we define the type enforcement. So whether it could be a server application or don't get confused between that these are all different. They are all in the same policy, but you define the rules there. And the kernel enforces it. So uh, it will be stored in where inode table or uh, super, uh, super Which block? Which one? All these uh, permissions will be stored in the inode table or uh, super block? Correct. So when it comes to files, I to, as I told before, these will be saved in the extended file attributes. You can view them using ls minus l, l capital Z. Let's say if you want to see these attributes on process, apply the same capital minus Z on the PS. Probably when the hands on come, I'll show you more on this. Yeah. Okay. So now we did this. We had two different types of process and we had two processors of the same type. Is it enough for our data center? or for the next gen data centers? Yes, 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 it is C3, C4. So next part of this is MLS. What exactly MLS is? Let's say we are having two different breeds of dogs. Okay. Let's say Greyhound and Chihuahua. Chihuahua is not supposed to eat Greyhound, but still Greyhound is allowed to eat. Let's say we have an application like that. That's where actually MLS comes into picture. So what exactly you do in MLS is, 
you actually create a sensitivity level so you classify your files based on your needs and you label them as these labels are just for representation purpose basically there will be some name based on your application let's say we are classifying the files as unclassified confidential secret and top level and you have a process with label secret you can actually define saying that okay a process running with label secret can read and write on the same label and anything classified below it it can read anything classified above that no access this is what exactly mls comes into picture so now that we have seen what are the basics for understanding SE Linux, right? Uh, how do I enable it? If I am a developer or if I am sysadmin, how do I know? So let us say if you have any Linux distro which is supporting SE Linux, basically SE Linux has three modes. One is disabled. Okay, before going into this, how many of you have ever run, even in your college or somewhere, the command set and force zero? Because good, you will never do that from now. <laughs> okay, so the reason being, it was tough to understand during those times like what exactly is my system behaving why is it behaving like that because the avc denial was so difficult in the initial days to understand what what is he trying to convey so as usual we you, we would do a google go to stack overflow some other other guy would have mentioned okay just do set and force zero your problem will be solved we go and do that but actually we should not be doing it um, so how do i enable my application or anything to be compliant with SC Linux. So, before going into that, you need to understand that there are basically three modes. One is disabled, other one is permissive, the other one is enforcing. Disabled, as it shows, there is no SC Linux enforcement at all. So, if you keep your machine in disabled state, the kernel will only look at the DAC version. No MAC checks will be done. What is permissive? Permissive is where the MAC checks are made. So, all the type enforcement rules are checked but it will still allow you to access and it will give a log error. So permissive should only be used when you are trying to determine what rules you are going to write. The third part is enforcing. Enforcing is where it is hardened. That means if there is no rule associated to the operation you are trying to make, you are not supposed to do that operation. So how do I define the configuration? As all files it is available in etsy configuration files you can go and modify it and if you want to write a shell script or something to see how it is you can enable sc status or get enforced um, so I, I have been telling you for two three times now that when you are trying to develop an application you got to ship your own policy right what do i exactly mean by policy so basically someone was asking where it is stored right i think this slide will answer you what basically happens is there are some sc linux friend tools which will help you to develop a policy for your application basically if you run sc policy generate command it will generate the first three files which is type enforcement file file context file and the interface file the type enforcement file will actually contain the rules which we have defined. You remember the image where we are saying cat to allow cat food? Those kinds of rules will be defined in type enforcement. What will be in the file context? Any guesses? Okay, so let's say you are trying to install files in slash opt vendor third party bin. So you say that I am going to install some files in this folder and you have to label these files with this label. So someone has to give those labels right to the files which are so those labels are saved here so once you install your files and all of them are labeled that's when you write the rules the third one is the interface files the interface files is required for softwares like who support third party plugins let's say i have some service where third party people can generate their own you know plugin and plug in to me so I expose some of the basic interfaces so that they don't have to rewrite the same file context or the same type enforcement things. So all of these first three files are clubbed and compiled into a policy package. So this is basically a PP file which will be generated and this will be inserted into the kernel dynamically. What exactly this policy file will do is it will go and register a set of LSM rules. 
So whenever a process running based on the file context, right, kernel will call those callbacks, which will go internally check the type information. So let's look practically on what all the things we have seen, right? So let's start from a sysadmin perspective. So in order, so let's say you already have deployed your software. How do you move to SC Linux now? So the first thing you have to do is change the SC Linux to permissive because this is very, very, very important. The reason being when you are re labeling your entire system and there is no rule available currently based on your infrastructure, the system might go for a toss. So that's the reason first and initial thing what you have to do is change your status to permissive. Now you see the policy current mode, it is in enforcing. What you have to do is you have to go change the etc sc linux config file and change it to permissive. What will exactly happen when it turns to permissive? Whatever is the rule, you will just get the logs, but you, he will still allow you to access. And how do I relabel it? Either you can create a file called dot auto relabel or you can use a command called fix files on boot. So what and if you try to reboot and all of your file system will be relabeled and it will be ready for with SC Linux in permissive mode. That's when you your picture comes. So let's say you are trying to ship a Apache server. So as any developer let's do echo welcome to OSI. So all it has this and I have already started my HTTP service. You go there, it says ok, you are in the test page, you are ready to deploy. So what we do is, we move our HTML file like any other developer, I have created it in the sandbox. What you do is, you move this index.html to var www html file and you just restart the service, right? So it is supposed to display welcome to OSI, but did it display? No. Any guesses why? So as any regular guy, what would we do? We will go to var www html and try to do ls minus l to see if he has write permission read. Everybody has a read permission, but it does not work. But the thing what he has missed is if you append minus l, it says you remember the labeling part. Okay, let me push it up. Remember the labeling part? It says it is an admin home t type which he is not supposed to do. How do I get to know about this? Where will SC Linux actually log this thing? SC Linux will log all of these things in actually where log audit audit.log. Very big file. I am not able to understand anything. What do I do next? So is there any intuitive way of looking at it? So there are some tools like one of my favorite is actually cockpit. Anybody using cockpit here? Try using it, it is actually very good. So if you are not very familiar with command line, right, this actually gives you a very intuitive web page which actually you can monitor your entire system. So I have installed a plugin called SC Linux. If you go here, he says, can you read the second error? SC Linux is actually preventing, oh, it's So it actually says SC Linux is preventing HTTPD get attributes access on the file. So how do I fix it if I am admin? All I have to do is there is a very very user friendly tool called audit to allow. Audit to allow will actually convert all of the AVC denials into type enforcement rules. So if you run audit to allow minus A, I mean I am just giving convert everything. It says allow HTTPD to access admin home type 
which is and the object is file the operation is get attributes but technically we should not be doing it the reason being there is already a policy in place all you have to do is a restore con on this file now if you try to run this it is relabeled as httpd underscore sys underscore content c so where did it get this data from the policy package which we have mentioned right it clearly has a file context file which says that whatever files are installed under var www.html should be labeled as sys content t that's where he goes reads the policy and relabels it now if i try to refresh the page it should show as welcome to us this is from the sys admin perspective we still have time okay so now let's look ahead and see if you are a developer and if you are having a app how do you write a policy so all you have to do is this is a very very simple application which actually sleeps because it's afternoon sleep for 15 seconds and just prints hello os i days and writes lights will guide you home to syslog so if i run this application now and go to a different one minus a u x minus capital z grep first what is it running under it is running as unconfined the reason being you are writing a software you feel it is secured though sc linux is in enforcing mode still your process is running under unconfined what does unconfined underscore t means is it is the default so let's say if you are shipping any software without a, a policy in place it will run by default in unconfined in case if there is a vulnerability in this he literally gets access to each and everything on your server so how do i write a policy for this so there is a command called sc policy generate sc policy generate and you say what kind of application you are doing is it an application is it a init application stands for any cli init stands for any service which you are trying to run and you have to give the name let's say second time what it actually does is it will actually create the basic files which i have mentioned before the one which is type enforcement file the other one is the file context file and the interface file the spec and second time dot sh are the scripts which will help you to build an rpm out of this and install on the kernel so after generating these files is my work done no because i have not mentioned what it is supposed to do what we need to do is we got to go install this policy put the sc linux again in permissive try to analyze the logs generate the type enforcement then add it to the policy once all your testing is done and regression is done over all the test cases let's say you have 100% of test coverage that's when you got to ship the application with the policy so any more queries so any more queries on generating the policy okay so with that i would like to conclude one thing please if you are looking at the next gen data centers please try to have proactive security it it need not be sc linux as such it could be anything because instead of waiting for the vulnerabilities to be discovered then patched we need something in that time gap that's where you know proactive security comes into picture and one such mechanism is sc linux so you can actually do an interesting search of sc linux and uh, shell shock they show how we try to mitigate and all and uh, please keep proactive security in your mind and do not turn off sc linux so some of the references which i can give you is these are the uh, people who are uh, very proactive in developing sc linux the first url is where dan called dan walsh he is prominently known as mr sc linux he has a live journal in case if you have any queries you can post it there or you can connect with me as well we can have some interesting discussions and uh, you remember the diagrams which i showed you about the cats and dogs actually it was 
uh, officially published by the SE Linux author called SE Linux Coloring Book. It's very interesting. Go have a look, and uh, I'm open for any questions. This is based on content. Content, content based. Yes, this is completely content based. That's why I was saying this is not a hardline security. This is completely a proactive one. It's a good to have yeah. where you can control what service can access what content. Well, really. So all these uh, permissions will be uh, stored uh, in a slash proc directory or? Uh, Which permissions? No, no, no. Uh, as I mentioned before, right? When you write all of these three files, which is type enforcement, file context and all, these get generated as a binary. Okay. And these go and directly lie in the SCLinux database, which is handled by the kernel. All in the binary format. They are not plain text. Okay. So one more question. Uh, similar to what we used to have in other uh, Linux or uh, Unix flavors, user and uh, kernel mode context switching, same thing applies here? Yes. yes. It does Only not actually impact any of your regular flow. All it does is, it actually enables some of the LSM handles. Okay. So there is something called Linux security models. So when you write these rules, so these go and sit as a callback function. So whenever any of these processes with these types gets accessed, then those LSM callbacks will be kicked in and based on the rules, it allows or does not allow is what is called. So it will not hamper any of the... No, no, it will not hamper any of them. There is <coughs> completely no hamper of any of this. Yeah. Uh, earlier you mentioned about App Armor. Yeah. Uh, can you tell me more about it as in how is it distinct from SE Linux? So actually App Armor is also one other implementation of MAC. Basically they will also have some rules with respect to labels as well. I have actually not worked on much on App Armor, but all I can say is uh, the configuration and the way it kicks in is a bit different from what SE Linux is. So, you can always think it as this way. There are two, three people who are leading the industry with respect to enterprise Linux. Uh, one such is Red Hat, the other one is SUSE. So, SUSE, Ubuntu are all confined towards App Armor. Debian is always dangling. Some customers use SE Linux on Debian, some customers use App Armor. So, based on their, you know, technical expertise, people try to choose. But the reason why I chose SE Linux was the same thing. So we are trying to write applications which will scale across, you know, mobiles, servers, laptops, anywhere. And SE Linux is actually supported in all of this. That's the reason I chose SE Linux as a proactive security. 